This is the No Estimates movement. But I like to I like to gauge the audience because there's actually there's more of you than there are me. Uh, I like to know where the punch might come from. So where are my developers? Got some devs, all right, there's my friends. Who's in a PMO or in a project management role? Okay. Okay, so I, we're going to get along by the end. So I, this is one of those talks where I hope you stay with me because uh, I think at the end we're gonna find a lot more congruence than we find disagreement. So, uh, all right, so this is me, or at least this is a slide about me. Uh, RyanRipley.com is the website, at Ryan Ripley on Twitter. Send me an email if you have questions or comments about this topic or talk. Always happy to discuss these ideas or any other Agile ideas. Uh, Agile for Humans is a podcast that I, I produce. So this podcast has grown from uh, a coach's support group. You know, I find as a scrum master or agile coach, uh, we need support because we're in a client situation and uh, things aren't going great and, and you need someone to bounce ideas off of. Don Gray had the, the wonderful idea of publishing it and the rest is history. This is now uh, the most downloaded agile podcast on iTunes. A lot of smart people like Tim Ottinger, who you saw this morning is a frequent guest. Uh, I try to say very little. I let them say quite a bit and it turns into a very good show, so I hope you check that out. And then the stuff at the bottom, um, I'm good at taking tests. So that's about all of those. <clears throat> Path17 is the Twitter hashtag, who's gonna tweet during this? Where are my tweeters? Okay, so when you send a tweet out, which I totally encourage, uh, Path17 is the hashtag. This helps grow awareness of the conference. And with higher awareness, they can get more speakers, more attendees, they can do more things. So this helps Koha, uh, the, the creator of this conference, uh, get the word out in a very inexpensive but effective way. So if you're gonna send a tweet or use social media, please use the hashtag. It, uh, it definitely helps them out. Hashtag no estimates. So this is an actual hashtag on Twitter where the, a lively discussion ensues about no estimates. I'm not responsible for what happens if you tweet to this hashtag. <laughs> you have been warned. It's a very good discussion, sometimes it's not so good. But uh, it is out there and if you want to engage, uh, welcome, uh, but I'm not responsible for what might happen. Questions. There are microphones in this room. If I talk for 75 minutes, I will fall asleep up here. I want your questions. If I say something, that sounds a little odd, or that triggers you, or that you wanna push back on or question, throw your hand up, a mic will find you. I'd rather have that dialogue than actually just lecture. Uh, I think it's a far richer experience if we have a back and forth. So if you wanna ask a question, even up front, feel free, throw your hand up, we'll get a microphone over to you. Plus it gives me a chance to take a drink of water, so I appreciate that. I think our industry suffers from this foundational problem. Uh, we have the same old thinking that leads to the same old results, even when we attempt an agile transformation. We actually don't change the thinking and we don't change the results. And I think Plinko's at fault. I, who loves Plinko? I love Plinko. It pains me to make Plinko the villain of this talk, but it is. I don't believe in waterfall. I don't think waterfall's a real thing. Right? I think sometimes we call, any, we call the boogeyman waterfall, but projects really, that's not a great metaphor in my opinion. I think Plinko is a brilliant way to talk about, well, because I came up with it, but I think it's a great way to talk about how projects have been run over the last 30, 40 years. It starts off, we're all very happy and smiling, right? We have our plan together, we think we know what's gonna happen, we're about to place our chip on the board, and start the process. Everything smiles and happy. We have an estimate of cost to the side, that $300 mark. It's perfect. And then we stare down this, this maze of complexity. This is your organizational dysfunction. This is every bad thing that can happen on a project. This is every assumption you didn't bother to vet out. Oh, and by the way, you don't get any value till the chip gets to the very bottom. This is a modern project. And outside of, even inside an agile context. 
we still do this. The problem is, we've been doing this since the 80s, just like The Price is Right, and we're not getting the results. And here's why. There are prerequisites to Agile. Otherwise, the same old thinking applies. The first one is experimentation. We have to risk being wrong. Totally uncomfortable in today's modern corporations. Who works in a very large organization? How many of you are bragging or, or, or celebrating failures? A couple. It's not common. But when you have a, an experimentation mindset, some of your bets, some of your hunches, some of your experiments will miss. If you do not live in a space of experimentation, you do not live in an agile space. Safety. <laughs> it's interesting to have a safety slide with a bunch of arrows shot at multiple targets. But what this means is we have to be able to miss, right? Except for this person who hit the target in the opposite direction. <laughs> I don't know what that was. That, that might be the kind of experiment that gets you in trouble. But all of the other ones are honest shots that are taken that we thought would fly true. Some of them hit, some of them miss. And we need the safety to be able to do this. Continuous learning. If we do not have validated learnings from our experiments and continually apply those lessons that we've learned, we're not in an agile place. And delivery. We have to ship something. We actually have to get something out the door and into our customers' hands. And we need to do it frequently because we value feedback loops, specifically short feedback loops. FedEx has thousands of flights every day. They're shipping all over the place, and they're collecting feedback continually through data points on everything they do. We need to do the same. And if we're not, we're not in an agile space. And if we're not in an agile space, no estimates cannot exist, OK? So the, the, the key point here is this is an Agile idea, and it's advanced Agile idea. It's predicated on these four things. And the manifesto supports this. The manifesto, I always go back to it. Whenever I'm having this Agile epiphany, I try to make sure that it's rooted in something from the manifesto. In this case, it's the top paragraph that no one reads. So this is a check-in. Agile in, in and of itself, the manifesto is an experiment. I mean, it's a beautiful preamble. We are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. Through this work, we have come to value. This is not in stone. At one point in time, this is what people thought, but it continues to evolve and change. This is experimentation, and there's safety behind this. And we are continually learning from, our, from delving into the manifesto, and we're shipping. It's inherent to what we do. And the Stacy diagram, who's seen this? If you were in my last talk, you saw it. This just shows us why this is all so critical. Agile lives in a place of complexity. Uh, if you're a Kinefin fan, it's the probing that we do, that we try to learn. If you, have close, if you are close to certainty and close to agreement, skip Agile, build the thing, and ship it. You're not discovering anything. You're not in a space of uncertainty, and Agile is way too expensive for that. Now, if you're far from certainty and far from agreement, you're in a complex space. We're trying to learn. Now it makes sense to try experiments, apply those learnings, you know, plan, do, check, act. This is why we do these practices. If you're not in that blue space, though, it makes no sense. Is that good? Is that clear? If I laid a groundwork of where no estimates can live? Okay. So what is an estimate? I need some help. Who can tell me what an estimate is? Yeah. Guess. Okay. You're right. Who else has a concept of an estimate? The largest, number the, the, the largest number the sponsor won't refuse. I love that answer. <laughs> that sounds like a negotiation, though. Who else? This is, let's wait. This is interactive. Who else has an, an idea of an estimate? My PMO friends over here. What's an estimate? Anybody? Relative sizing. Relative sizing, okay. The lies that developers tell you? <laughs> Whoa, where are my devs? That's a great answer. Yes. Determinism, yes. 
That's probably the coolest answer I've been given to that question so far. His answer was determinism. Think about that for a minute, it'll make sense. That was really, that's interesting. Anyone else? A deadline is a deadline, not an estimate though. So the point of the question is really that we conflate estimates, targets, commitments, deadlines. We use these terms interchangeably, but they all do not mean the same thing, which is part of the, dis of the dysfunction around estimate programs. So if we go to uh, the sources, right? So dictionary.com says an approximate judgment or calculation, Merriam-Webster, judge tentatively or approximately, American Heritage Dictionary, the tentative evaluation or rough calculation, a judgment. Uh, Johanna Rothman in Predicting the Unpredictable said literally guess. Uh, software estimation by Steve McConnell, um, clear enough view is what I highlighted there. So essentially through all credible sources, and there's plenty more that you can Google, we can distill it down to guess. Is that fair? Does anyone want to push back on that? All right, so we all agree that an estimate is a guess. Here's why, and this is actually a, truly an eye chart for a room this size, but um, I'll, I'll walk through this. Instead of calling it a guess, I like to say an estimate is the sum of the effort or duration of the work, the accidental complication involved with the work, and the essential complication of the work. And let me break this down because these may be new terms. Uh, the effort is actually the domain knowledge and the skill. This is what the developers know. They know how to do the work, typically. And, and this is the number they give. Accidental complication is your technical debt, your organizational dysfunction, your heavy-handed processes, your broken deployment, deployment pipeline, bad story sizing, lack of clarity in the work, context switching, Poor whip, poor whip limits, uh, no collaboration, poor craftsmanship, all the things that we do that make it impossible to be predictable. And then it's a, the essential complication is a tornado blew our building down and we lost a week of effort while we had to move new offices. That's stuff you cannot predict. It's stuff that will happen because, because life is uncertain. So in other words, an estimate is the work plus the buffer. And that's why it's a guess. But why do we need estimates if they're just a guess? Can anyone tell me? Why do we need estimates? Planning. Sorry, go. Planning, Planning. okay. Budgeting. Budgeting, that just sounds like you need a budget. Maybe, yes. Distrust, so sure, that's why we might need an estimate. Anyone else? Go ahead. To make pretty charts, that's important. <laughs> so someone can validate their guess. So we're gonna predicate a guess on a guess. I like that. Yes? Framework for finding the end. You're in a PMO. <laughs> <laughs> Who else? Why do we need estimates? Accountability. accountability. So accountability is interesting. Uh, we got into this. So in the pure sense of the word, you're right. So we need something that we're going to impose on other people, which is what accountability is, right? So it's me holding you to a standard, not you, sir, the general you, instead of me accepting responsibility, right? Which I think could be an anti-pattern, but I think accountability is what they are used for. Someone else? And actually, what it sounds like is a commitment, which I, I don't like commitment. Yes? You're right, so in order for executives to make decisions, we're gonna hand them a guess, and they're gonna make bets about our company. You're right, we do that, don't we? But you're laughing because it kinda of sounds absurd, doesn't it? And I think we're gonna, we're gonna explore that laughter a little bit. Typically, estimates are required at the core because of, we need to make decisions. And we believe that a guess is a great way to make a decision. Does that sound right? I don't know. I would argue that people say they want to make decisions, but what we're really doing when we estimate is we are covering up all of the organizational dysfunction 
that we either do not want to face and clean up or that we cannot face and clean up. That middle column of accidental complication, that's why we estimate, because we are bad at doing the things that we should be doing well. Do estimates add value? What do you think? I'm sorry? So it depends on where you are in the life cycle of the program. So guesses are valuable at certain points of time. Yes? I'm sorry, can we get a mic to the back? Thank you. I said the estimates aren't valuable, but the conversation they create is. That's a fair answer. So the conversation around the estimate could be valuable, which means the estimate's not valuable. <laughs> But thank you. Anyone else? Our estimates valuable. We have PMO professionals, the smartest people in the Midwest, in here, and no one's going to defend the value of an estimate. Yes. So why estimate? Just go do it. Is it valuable? Is it ever like it was before? Perhaps. I think that it's a rare, it's an edge case, but I, I, I'm probably forced to agree. Anyone else? The value of, yes, ma'am. Now we're living, we're living in an agile space in this talk, right? Right? We're living in an agile space. I, I agree with you that there's some organizational dysfunction or practice there that the estimate covers. And that's, and that's, but it's only valuable in that we don't have to face the accidental complication of our organization. To me, that would be the only, uh, yes, in the very back. Let's, we'll talk about margin of error. I just find that to be a, a fancier guess. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. Uh, because they're magic numbers. Your margin of error is a magic number. All right? Uh, this recent election, this is not a Republican-Democrat talk. This is not a Clinton-Trump. Straight fact, Nate Silver, the, the greatest predictor of elections to ever live, gave Clinton an 80% confidence interval or margin or whatever word you'd like to use of winning the election. Uh, we know the result of that election. The 20% still happens, okay? Uh, magic numbers happen in a lot of ways. Uh, who's heard the multiply by two and add two weeks? Who's actually done this in an organization? It's a real thing. Uh, another one is make your estimates, add one and take the next unit. So if I think it's two weeks, we're gonna add one and make it three weeks, and now we're gonna make it three months. And that's, I've seen that used in Fortune 500 companies. Pad the numbers by 20%. Well, why not 40%? Because our friend told us back here that would be too high, they would never accept it. So just go 20%, magic numbers. Or Excel gymnastics. My favorite was a spreadsheet that a boss had put together that basically pat, padded a number but why, by basically you fill in the effort and then talk about the number of people impacted and departments in it through creative Excel gymnastics. You got a number that was so inflated you could never be wrong, <laughs> right? It's, yes, this will take 12 months, but we're just adding a line of code. It's 12 months, okay, we won't miss, we'll be good. This is my all-time favorite. So 60% of the time it works all the time. It, it, they're all magic numbers and they're nonsense. So when you say, this will take two weeks and I have a 50% confidence interval, you're taking a guess of a week and you're adding another guess of a confidence interval and you're saying it confidently to me and I'm supposed to accept it. So let's go back to McConnell. So Steve McConnell wrote Software Estimation. This is the Bible of estimation. This is the book on how to estimate software. He provides what a good estimate is, for the definition of a good estimate. So what he says is that a good estimation approach 
should provide estimates that are within 25% of the actual results 75% of the time. How does that sound to you? Give me $100,000. 25 or 75 percent of the time, I will hit your ROI within 25 percent plus or minus. The rest of the time, I could lose it all plus 10x, or I could win it all plus 10x. Who wants to give me $100,000? No one in this room. But this is what we say is a good estimate, and this is what we say our companies should use to invest. Of the large systems that are completed, 66% experience schedule delays and cost overruns because they're guesses. This is from Kafer Jones. McConnell comes back, he validates uh, the Standish report, Kafer Jones, basically says 80% of projects are later failed. I mean, is that sinking in? We're guessing and we're wrong a lot, which means we suck at guessing, right? A quarter of all projects are delivered on time, a quarter are canceled, and half are delivered late, over budget, or both. Here's, here's kind of the drop the mic moment. 17% of large IT projects go so badly that they actually, they threaten the existence of the company. Right, so we're taking a guess, and we're making a huge bet, and 17% of the time, we could actually close the doors of our company because we were just so far off. This is the problem that no estimates popped out of, all right? It's an acknowledgement that we are telling our companies, our executives, our leadership teams to make big bets on software with guesses. And then we use confidence intervals, more guesses. And not only that, 80% of the time we just fail and 17% of, of those failures could close our doors. Is this how you want to run a company? Who is actually in favor of this? It's so not a single hand up, but you do this every day. So no estimates, and I do it too. So this is not me like, you do this. I, I've been in these companies and I've made these decisions and I've followed these, these paths too. And they don't make sense when you actually look at the data, which is what no, no estimates is all about. No estimates. Woody Zool, uh, Duarte Vas or Vasco Duarte, and Neil Killick, three gentlemen on Twitter who started a conversation when they realized the absurdity of risking our companies on guesses. That's, all that, that's what triggered this whole discussion. Uh, Woody Zool is the idealist. He, Woody Zool is who I want to be when I grow up. I want to believe in the positive and turn up the good and, and have this very positive outlook on life. He's wonderful to talk to. I believe in humanity after talking to Woody Zool. Vasco Duarte is very data-driven. So his slant on no estimates is that we have enough data to forecast and to look at actuals instead of guessing. Neil Killick, I'm a, more, I'm a Neil, Neil Killickian type no estimates advocate. Uh, he's very pragmatic. And he says, let's just work in agile ways so that estimates are just redundant. And I like that. I like the, let's change the way we work so we don't even have to do it. So to give a flavor of, so the point here is there's no one definition of no estimates. It's a range of ideas. Woody Zool says, kind of like having this over here, uh, no estimates is a hashtag for the topic of exploring alternatives to estimates for making decisions in software development. That is ways to make decisions with no estimates. It's very straightforward. He does not want to estimate. Uh, Vasco Duarte, the premise is really estimates do not add any value directly. So he's taking a lean stance. He's saying this is a process that, that, that does not directly add value to our products. So we must find ways to reduce or eliminate. It's a very agile idea, right? We do that with everything on our, on our, on our processes. I mean, Scrum is based on lean. I mean, it, it, it is in our DNA to reduce the things that don't add value. And then Neil, it's not about ditching estimates, and he's right. You would find that neither Woody or Vasco or Neil would say never estimate. But we're trying to improve the ways that we work so that estimates are redundant. So it's a continuous improvement play. And this is the one that I subscribe most to, but I actually follow Neil, or I follow Vasco and Woody as well. 
for me, the way that I have framed no estimates, we have options, right? So we can do an estimate, which to me is like the farmer's almanac. Who's familiar with the farmer's almanac? So this is a, it predicts weather. It's created 18 months ahead of time. So this book was worked on in 2013. They're, in 2013, they're writing a book about what the weather will be in 2015. Sounds like a project, right? It's about 50% right. You're just as good doing a coin flip than reading the Farmer's Almanac. Phenomenal, right? I'd say you're better off just looking up at the sky. <laughs> it's really, or, or in a project sense, looking at where you're at today is just as good as having this long range estimate. But for me, this is the, the no estimate sweet spot. I want this. I want my projects to be the Doppler radar. That arm swoops around the screen and updates with new data continually and a new forecast that changes constantly. Because life is uncertain, we have a lot of uncertainty baked into our projects because we have a lot of accidental complication, and so I want to know how that's directing my project as quickly as possible. This to me is no estimates. Are we good? Easy group, I like this. I like to count. So that's, this is the extent of the math that I believe in for an estimation process. I just want to count things. So it's really forecasting. And the count, my kids love the count. Is one, uh, uh, I do that with my story points. Actually, I killed story points. And we just have cards. And so when my, when my teams, they move a card all the way across the board, I go, one, uh, 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 and they, they kind of chuckle. And then after like the 50th story, they get a little irritated. But. But it's interesting that you can abandon planning poker, you can abandon story points, and roughly get the same outcome. So a very smart guy, Bill Handlin, he uh, worked for Microsoft during this. So it's large organizations buying into these ideas, right? Uh, looked at 60 projects that used relative estimates. And essentially what he did, uh, he smashed every relative estimate or every planning poker, oh, this is a 13, this is a five, or you know, what's the difference between a 13 and a five? I don't, I don't know. Said they're all one. And what he found is the predictive accuracy, the variance was 3%. So planning poker is now a waste of your time. It's not, is it worth the 3% variance? And then we can lay this out. So when you use one, three, and five, those are the only cards you're allowed to use, which means you're slicing your work small. Uh, a release, and this is one of the projects that Bill used as an example. Release date on October 20th. When you just use one, two, and three, flatten it a little bit, the release date goes to October 14th. And when everything's a one, it's September 29th. I mean, it, if you're within two or three weeks anyways, you're a winner, right, PMO friends? That's just a quick change order. You can hide that somewhere. Ooh, too, too close. <laughs> it's like, there's just like a chuckle like, ha, 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 ha. But it's, it's, you laugh because it's kind of true. 3% variance, which means every story can be a one. And that's, that's one of the key learnings of the no estimates movement. And if you need further validation, you know, Ron Jeffries, we all owe our careers in some extent if you're working in an agile way to Ron Jeffries. And very few have given more. I would argue Kent Beck's up there. But Ron is, um, I owe my career to, to his teachings. He created Velocity, which is the, the, the analysis of story points over time. And he, I think he said he may have created it. Um, he's, he's outright just denying it. So if you're using velocity, the creator of the concept is saying don't. That's strong advice. So what do we do with this count? This is a cumulative flow diagram, the most powerful tool in your, in your arsenal. So if you're counting stories, it means that you can actually project out and gain insights into your work. So if you look at this chart, maybe I'll look over here, or you can look at whatever screen you like, but I'm gonna look over here. Uh, you have dev, test, and done. So for illustrative purposes, I've separated dev and test and done. But these are really just the swim lanes, or the columns, I'm sorry, on your Kanban board, or on your, your team board. 
So each day you count how many items are in development and how many items are in test and how many items got to done. And each day you do a new dot. So first you count and then you draw a dot and then you draw a line between two dots. That's it. It's amazing, right? But when you look at what you get from it, uh, the whip, how much work is in process, is the distance between dev and done. That's how many things you have in flight at once. That's an interesting, interesting data point. Uh, the cycle time is the, the horizontal difference between dev and done. So now you know how long it takes to go from we're starting to work on this to getting to production. Incredibly valuable if you're looking to continually improve. Uh, you can also look for trends. And so you can see where the lines kind of diverge. So a bottleneck is formed. Now you have an insight to take into a retro or into a, dis a discussion with developers about, hey, these lines are diverging. Why are things not going from test to done? And perhaps a tester was out sick for a week and that makes sense and you move on. Or perhaps the dev team has taken on too much work and they're out running the dev team or the test team. All sorts of reasons, but it's the insights by counting cards, drawing a dot, and drawing lines. Phenomenal, phenomenal data, minimum uh, investment. And then if you want to be fancy, you can also do this in uh, Excel, and you can have the prettier graphs in most of the tools that we use. A few examples. So in the top left, everything went flat. Any ideas on what would cause all three areas to go flat? I need to take a drink of water. Who's going to help me? Holiday. Holiday, that's a great answer. So this is Europe, where they take a month off, <laughs> right? And everything went flat for a while. No big deal. Everyone was out. When they got back, work continued. In the upper right, uh, the lines are diverging, bottlenecks galore. What do you think is going on there? kind of gave the answer on the, on, the, on the slide. There's a lot of work in process, I think, or that's a possible question. And it's, it's continued to increase instead of swarming the open items and getting them to done. So that's a good question for your teams. In the bottom right, everything's going along, and then suddenly everything spikes up to done. What do you think happened there? Come on, PMO, what happened? We had a hard date, we got to that date, and we shipped it, right? Ran out of funding. <laughs> out of funding. It's another good one. I like that. Uh, and then in the bottom left, you know, there's a cadence forming on shipping. So why are we only going to de or why are we only shipping to prod every month? Why is this cadence emerging? What's stopping us from going sooner? As an Agile, we want to get to prod sooner. We want the feedback to make improvements, right? So all of this, all of these insights, all these questions, all of this new capability to bring up in your retrospectives, your meetings, your discussions with devs, because you can count your stories, draw a dot, and draw a line. It's kind of like a sushi train. Anyone ever eaten at one of these? Yeah, pretty cool, aren't they? Did you like it? To me, yeah, you did? Yeah. Good. Grab whatever looks good. That's kind of the point of Agile, right? Uh, to me, this is the perfect metaphor for agility. And I like to talk through that a little bit. So this is what no estimates gives us. Uh, first of all, we pay for the whole meal, right? So when you walk into the sushi, the sushi train place, you find out um, what the price is. And maybe it's $20 to sit down at the table. But there's value in the smaller pieces. So yes, the whole costs something X number of dollars, but there's value in the smaller parts because the smaller parts make up the meal. So it's kind of interesting that there's value in the smaller pieces. And you take what you want. You're the, you own the product. You are the product owner. You take the pieces that are important to you. You leave the ones that aren't. Meanwhile, they have sensors. They know what you're taking. So in the background, they know that the shrimp tempura is running low. They've got to get more on there. Fascinating concept. What else can you derive from this type of metaphor that relates back to agility? Sorry? 
go get a mic. Or Matt can come down. Keep it moving. Continuous delivery. That train's always moving and they're continually shipping food on it. It's a great insight. Who else? What else do you see from agility? Yes. I'm sorry. Yep. <laughs> so how do you know someone will actually eat the thing you put out? So you're forecasting because you know what was taken in the past. So you're, you're still guessing, but you're actually doing it with data. It's not just we think it'll be this because our organizational dysfunction clouds us. It's we know last Tuesday when the show let out and people came to the restaurant, we sold 87 pieces of shrimp tempura. Let's have 90, 95 ready. Pretty good decision making, right? Yeah, I see a lot of those things in this too. And I think this is actually where we're trying to get to uh, as an agile, as far as our practices go. But there's complications to this. So no estimates isn't free. It's not just taking all of your story point estimates, slicing them down to a one, making a dot, drawing a line, and calling yourself good. We have to get good at slicing. You know, I love the sushi metaphor. This is incredibly difficult. Have you ever tried to slice sushi? Anybody? How hard is this? Very. Very. So you need an incredibly sharp knife. You need to roll the sushi roll incredibly tight. Uh, it takes tons and tons of practice. It's no different than story slicing. I think there was actually a talk today uh, I think it was in the last session. Who went to the story slicing discussion? Heard it was a great discussion. Incredibly important skill, really hard to get good at, right? Because now we're saying this feature's important, but only this middle slice of it. And you have to convince others that those other pieces can fall away. It's a difficult discussion. It's also difficult from a developer perspective to go from a horizontal slice all the way down to, let's say, UI, UX to database and deliver just a sliver because they feel like it's incomplete and there's embarrassment and there's shame and there's all these, but it's not a full feature. It's like we know it's a slice and we need that slice so that we can be predictable. Some people use heuristics or guides. So this is a sushi guide. If you get caught using this by a sushi pro, they kind of giggle, but it's okay. I've used one of these. Um, what does this look like to software teams? This looks like a story can only have one acceptance criteria. Otherwise, it's too big. You've got to slice it. That's one heuristic. That's one way that we can look at a story and say, wow, there's five acceptance criteria here. It's too big. Another heuristic is it's got to fit between one and three days. So are you estimating duration? A little bit, but intuitively and you're slicing it small enough that if you're wrong, it, it's really okay. So there's actually greater, there's less risk, greater safety in that. Whatever heuristic your team lands on, it's an aid to story slicing, and it's critically important to what we do. And eventually, after a lot of effort, uh, your sushi looks like this, and your stories are small, they're complete. Every piece of sushi has this, is, is a complete piece. We're not cutting it horizontally and some people only get rice, and some people get the avocado, and other people get the salmon. It's a complete piece. It's, it's a vertical. Actually, it is a horizontal. It's not the vertical. There is such a thing as rotten sushi, though. Sorry, what? Yeah, this is bad. This is like grocery store sushi, right? Who has grocery store sushi? It's tasty sometimes. But this can happen. This is your backlog. So I, I always ask, how many of you have an item in your current product backlog that is more than six months old? Okay, we're not being honest. Hi, David. More than a year old. Two years old. We have hands up at two? Three. Three years, anybody? Do we have one? You're never going, okay, four. Are his hands still up? These lights are like four, five, six. Six brought your hand down? Wow. You're never going to build any of that. <laughs> are you? You're never going to build any of that. 
It's been in your backlog for six years. But that happens, and I'm just teasing. I'm, I'm sorry. It's not, a, it's, not to be, it's not a slam. It's to have a little fun. But even the people with things for a year, two years, three years, six years, wow. Um, you're not going to build these things. And it's stopping you from forecasting your backlog. It's cognitive load. It's things you're worried about. You got to do some plate clearing here. Literally, this has to be cleaned up, right? This is nasty. So when you're looking at your backlogs, be ruthless. We got to get the rotten sushi out of the backlog. That thing that's six years old, you're not going to build it. That thing that's one year old from David in the back, you're not going to build it. And a well-groomed backlog is essential to this practice, right? Because we are forecasting. We're taking everything in our backlog and we're saying we know we can do five stories a sprint. And so we're going to project that out forever. And with this rotten sushi, these stories we don't understand, these six-year-old things that we haven't uh, refined in years, these things cloud that forecast and make it difficult for us to be consistent and predictable. So we have to, we have to clean our backlogs. And, and honestly, here's why. So when we have a clean backlog, we know what's valuable, we know what isn't. We cut the thing that isn't valuable in the red and we move on to the next valuable thing. Otherwise, we just build all of it and hope at the end that we did something good, right? And this is, this is typical, this is our Plinko. You know, the, the, the coin's going to bounce all the way to the bottom, it's either gonna hit zero or 10,000 or somewhere in between. <clears throat> I often get, who has the question about alignment with business? But if we're not estimating, how do we keep our business partners in line? Who's worried about this? Do we have enough hands sufficient to go into it? Well, why don't you ask? <laughs> so this is, to me, you know, they, they say we need estimates to stay in alignment with our business. I think that's nonsensical. To stay in alignment with your business partners, go talk to your business partners. It's really that simple. Map out your needs, your wants, your concerns, your events, your issues. Uh, there's a great model for this. This is one way to do it. And update this weekly, monthly, quarterly. Have a running conversation with your business partners. Estimates are hiding your dysfunction. This brings everything to light. Oh, by the way, we have an architecture decision that we're making on the back end database that's going to impact our roadshow event in the following month. Maybe we should talk about that. Instead of what I've seen typically today is IT just updates the database, breaks the demo, scramble, 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 you know, up till midnight, 1, 2, 3 a.m., heroics, event goes okay or it doesn't. This to me makes more sense. And it doesn't require estimation to actually, to actually have this conversation. Can we have a question? Yeah. Hold on, we got the, so we have the microphone, we have the lady in the back, then the gentleman here. Were there any more hands that shot up because I said something heretical? Uh, I guess I, I'm getting a little bit uh, confused how you keep talking about forecasting versus estimates. So if you're starting a project yeah. and you're trying to get it approved, do you give the business a forecast of what you think it will cost? No. Do you have to give them some sort of baseline before they just jump in without any idea if it's a million dollars or sure. $15 million? Yeah, so this is the, the budgeting question. And how do we get that budget secured? Uh, I think that's risky based on what we talked about before that anything I hand you, let's say I'm trying to get a million dollars out of you to do a project. Anything I hand you, we've agreed as a guess. That's a premise that didn't get a lot of challenge. If you want to challenge that, I'm happy to go back to it. So that's risky. And it's risky enough that a percentage of the time it could tank our company. So I don't want to do that. What I'd rather do is say I have this experiment or this idea and I need $10,000 to try it for two weeks. That's what it will cost me to run a team. And at the end of it, I'm going to come to you with a validated learning from that experiment and show you what could potentially happen based off of this learning, what the value could be based on what we learned from talking to a customer, and I'd like you to make a decision on whether or not to fund this further. 
Now, I don't want a million dollars. I want 200,000 after that, if I validated the learning, to continue to prove the model. And at any point, if I have not proven the value to you, kill it, and let's do the next valuable thing. To me, that's an adult conversation, right? To me, that's basically saying, I want to have a validated learning at each step. I want to make the minimum investment, take the lowest risk in an attempt to capture value. What do you think? Yes. How do you do that with like a large portfolio of like 50 projects or one for budget a finite budget? So 50, so 50 projects, yeah. $40 million, dollars, and somebody has to make a decision where that waterline is, and you're in the middle of these sprints that are actively delivering during budget year and you're trying to plan for that next year. Well, clearly this doesn't work with an annual budget cycle. It's counter, it's counter to validated learning. So your first challenge is, no, you shouldn't leave now. Uh, you got about 30 minutes left. No, but it is a common situation, right? But this is a budgeting issue. So if you have 50 projects, uh, what I would do is clean up the backlog because you don't have 50 important projects. In my experience, you don't. Well, all right, so now you're, again, they're not important. Sorry, I've, I worked in medical device for a number of years. It's, I get it. So, you, so go do them, because the risk of not doing them leads to government intervention, fines and fees. Why are you, why are you bothering with this? You have the ultimate, we have to do this card. So are you suggesting that you take that approach where you say yes to all the compliance projects, but then you run them in a, in a trial, how far can you get? Yes. With, you know, with ten thousand dollars. I think the goal is so a compliance project is really to avoid trouble, right? And so you're not capturing a value down the road. So what you basically want a C still gets you the degree, right? You like that? If you're outsourcing, so now we're leaving the agile space. So now we're, leave, we're, we're leaving an agile space. You said outsourcing though, right? So I think we're leaving the agile space or that space that we can talk in. <laughs> We're hiring agile teams to do development. Okay. I, um, it's a difference of opinion. So I, I find that when, as soon as we start the outsourcing process, we're looking as, at people as being fungible. And we're deciding that we can swap one person and one skill in for another. And there is a human aspect to the manifesto. There's a human aspect to agility that we're not honoring in that model. So it's not to criticize. I mean, it's a, it, your model is common. I just, I don't think this idea lives in a space like that. Yes. Uh -huh. um, I might be misunderstanding, but are you going from estimating the story time for hours into estimating the cost? No. Is that just how you came across? And I'm sure you did. I hope that you don't. No, I appreciate the question. So yeah, I don't, I'm not looking to estimate cost or duration, right? I'm looking to count cards. So the cost thing's interesting. So we know what it costs to fund an Agile team, right? We have the salaries, we know the, we know the running cost of a team sprint over sprint. So there's, that's your budgeting tool right there. So now we're just trying to figure out how much work can they do to capture value. And so that's a different discussion than a budget per se. So now what we're talking about is we have a well-refined backlog that has been sliced down enough to where we're consistently sized so that everything can be treated as a one. So now we're trying to get out the MVP quickly so that we can deliver soon and get feedback. We can, we can time box that. So we can say that a team that costs $10,000 a sprint, we wanna do four sprints worth of work and see what kind of value we captured before we commit to the bigger spend. That's all I'm advocating. It helps, it helps. It's dip so if you have wild variance in sizing, suddenly your predictability drops. 
So let, it's why story slicing is such a critical skill. I mean, it, you really need to get to a consistent sizing in order to get the kind of predictability that this requires. Yes? Um, I guess I'd like to challenge that last statement. Sure. Because um, if you look at your uh, delivery, whatever you're doing on your team, as a set of services, and you then you look historically, without having the slice, uh, and just look at your, uh, say, the histogram of your lead times, uh, you can still uh, predict with uh, you know, a known level of accuracy uh, what uh, the, lead, the planning lead time would be so that you don't have to count just stories, but you can use lead time uh, using that historical data by service to uh, be able to uh, forecast your delivery without having to just uh, do that vertical slicing exercise. Sure, it works. It works if the, the past work is similar or equal to the current work. Well, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of assumptions baked into this, but first of all, I find that unless you're doing a very specific set of services, that assumption rarely, rarely will hold up, right? The past rarely looks like the future, especially on, on, um, on software development teams. If it does, then you already know. So why are you doing Agile? <laughs> it's all known. You're, you're far, you have certainty and you have agreement. Just go build it. Plus, you're also talking about a tailing indicator, right? So when, we're, when we have the buffer, which is a, basically a, how we manage our dysfunction, as we talked about earlier, that can change, right? And you don't know it till many sprints out. No, but you keep re, you re you know, to see, to theoretically, if you're watching your flow and doing continuous improvement, right. then you're going to be wanting to remeasure and reforecast, and chances are you'll exceed your original plan. So it's a difference of decision here. So you're deciding to manage the dysfunction. I'm deciding to slice work as small as possible. I would rather work on the work than actually working on how to predict how dysfunctional we are. It's just a difference of opinion. So, I mean, if you want to work on the accidental complication and how to account for that and you find that valuable, I don't. I would rather slice work small enough to be predictable and then ship something. But there, there's a cost to do that. There's a cost to both, actually. And I would find at least I'm making an investment in the work over here instead of trying to come up with a magic number to account for dysfunction over here. Yeah, it's not hard. I, if it's working, great. But I find most companies struggle to actually put a number on the dysfunction. And, it's typic and typically, we're very optimistic about how bad we are at things, right? That's where you look at, at the history and you know, look at the distribution curve. It's like the stock disclaimer. You know, the past performance can't. I get it. As a, as a PMO person, we want to look at planning and estimation as valuable. And it's hard to, to look at focusing on the work. And I don't want to argue with you about it. I'm simply saying that I want to put my investment over here on the actual work, slice it, understand it, and ship it. I don't want to talk about magic numbers about dysfunction. Now, if, if your goal is we've estimated our dysfunction, we've come up with five ways to reduce it, and now we want to put that over here in the backlog as part of the product, I'm with you. I guess I, I just not characterize it as magic, I think that's... It's a guess, though. It's, no, it's not. It's, a, it's basically looking at its work data and uh, forecasting. I'm not doing any estimating. Okay. I'd rather estimate work, though, and not dysfunction, or forecast work and not dysfunction. See. And I think there's a, the, there's a nuance here. So I, I'm happy to talk to you afterwards. Yes. The yes. concept of no estimates, it's really interesting. Uh, it's a new thing that I've come across. But see, when you come to the basics in project management, uh, whether it is time estimation or it's cost estimation, which the finance requires in terms of ROI, things like that, yeah. how, can, how can you think of no estimates? Because sometimes ROI is driven because of estimates. Sure. And the time that uh, the team is going to take to complete the project is also driven by the time estimates. So without estimation, how can we 
think out of this estimation mindset. So, so I think part of it's education. I think, and, and show of hands, how many of you are shocked by the first part of this talk where we talk about the failures and the issues and the implications? Who's actually, who found some of that to be new or unknown? Wow, not a lot of people. I, I think within your organization, having the discussion around the fragility of estimates, uh, why they are fragile, all the things that we've discussed in accidental complication, I think is important. But I also don't advocate not estimating. And we'll get to, let me actually go to that. I, I'm pragmatic. You're not gonna be able to go to work on Monday or what's today? You can't go to work tomorrow and say, that's it. The guy on the stage said estimates are bad. We're not doing it anymore. It's not an approach. There are incremental steps you can take to prove out some of these theories. Uh, if you estimate in hours, move to story points. Get away from the, the time-based estimate and get over to planning poker because you can start the forecasting process off of, a, off of a story point. So yes, velocity is bad, but it's better than hour estimates. Okay, uh, don't estimate your tasks. Like leave that to the development team. Keep estimation at a story level. These are incremental improvements you can make that can get you closer to flattening out your estimation process. Uh, limit the size of stories. Slicing is critical. I, it is one of the, 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 the superpowers of agile teams. If you can slice your work down and refine it to the point to where you're delivering just the essential, uh, you're winning. It is, it, it, is the, it is at the heart of, of being able to do a lot of these practices. Uh, if you use story points, only use one, three, and five. I don't know what an eight, a 13, a 21, all I know is those are too big, right? So let's get down into the one, three, and five and start that slicing and breakdown process. Uh, build these diagrams. I think it's critically important to actually build out and, and visualize how your work's flowing so you can gain some of these insights that might have been missed by, oh, we'll have it done in two weeks. But we have no clue where the other work is, right? Um, every story can be a one. So as you progress through this, get to one. Because it is a possibility through practice and, and technique. And then negotiate decisions, not estimates. Like, I'm not a fan of the uh, estimate negotiation game. You know, the team goes to the management or the or the stakeholder, let's say. Let's leave managers alone, they take enough abuse. Team goes to the stakeholder and says, this is six weeks and a million dollars. And the stakeholder says, I have three weeks and 50 bucks. There's no, that's not negotiable, right? But the decisions can be. So you can go back and say, you asked for 30 features with your timeline and budget, perhaps we can forecast out and hit five. And that's a decision that you can look at but actually negotiating on the numbers is always a losing game. So I think these are steps that you can take to progressively get to this type of thinking. Yeah, so it's back to uh, these diagrams. So basically visualizing the progress of your work through the various stages that you track. Anyone else? I guess we can go into, since we've been doing Q&A, we can continue it. We'll get some mics going around. Are there lots of questions? Yep. Uh, ye yes, I do have a question. I have, I'm having a, a hard time understanding the word guess. I think we have been throwing it around like um, some form of magic or, 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 or whatever. How about, can we work with a definition of educated guess? because I think there is some relevance in, in that as well. So that's the first question. The second question is, help us understand what do you mean with pragmatic, that you are pragmatic in, 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 in this sense. Would, sure. would help me. So could you repeat your first question? Yes, can we get rid of the word guess as if, as if it has no uh, uh, liability, uh, reliability at all and work with the term educated guess? Well, I, I think it's really just you're putting a modifier on guess, right? So you want to say educated guess? Yes, based on historical data. Yeah, there is data there, like the sushi company. There were 90 last week. On, on Saturday, they are going to make 90 again and start from there and make some more, right? So that's educated guess. Sure. I still think it's risky. Everything I, is risky. I mean, what's not? 
I, I think there's ways to reduce the risk of guessing, whether it's educated or not. I think educated is a good way to say, look, we, we took a peek into what makes us dysfunctional. We took a peek into why we have issues at an organizational level. We accounted for that. We're good. And I think that's a trap. I, it, it could be as an opportunity, though. We sh we, we're trying to hit it. This one, let's, let's, just, let's just motivate the group and, and hit it. Certainly. I don't disagree with you there. But I educated guests or guests, to me, we're, we're playing word games when, a, when we could just be fixing the dysfunction in the organization that makes the guests irrelevant. So you also asked about pragmatic. So what about pragmatism? I, I just want to understand what you mean with it because it's, yeah. it came in whatever. Yeah, so it gets back to the, the sushi train. So this is how, you know, this is more of a, a Neil Killick slant on, on no estimates. We get to the point where we have continuous delivery, continuous flow of work, we're constantly shipping, our product owners who are embedded with us are providing input if you're on a scrum team and we're shipping constantly. Why do you need an estimate? I've actually found that this creates a high trust environment between business and tech or business, business and dev and suddenly those discussions kind of drop away, those discussions about estimates. So from a, from a pragmatic standpoint, if you can actually get your delivery and development into this kind of continual state of development and delivery, those conversations just drop. They become redundant, as, as Neil states. That's all I mean by pragmatic. I'd rather just work in a way where we don't have to do this. We don't have to guess about software. We can just show software. Because even, now let's go back to the manifesto. Working software is our only measure of progress, right? That's the only thing that, we, that actually counts to us as Agilists. Nothing else, not a magic number about margin or whatever else, it's we have something, we shipped it. Now let's talk about that, let's look at it and figure out how we're gonna ship again. Does that make sense? Yes. So uh, I assume that the scary numbers and statistics about risk and betting the company uh, on large projects that those are not based on uh, organizations that are completely agile, as you've been talking about, where end to end, we're, we're doing agile. Yeah, interestingly right. enough, those uh, companies are included. And so there is still uh, but, companies. But, but, but the numbers include those companies that are not doing that, I'm assuming. It's both. Right, it's, it's a mix of yes. just companies. Yeah, just because a company throws the agile flag in the ground doesn't mean they've solved all of their organizational dysfunction. Do you know, is there any stats on, so let's say we focus on companies that you consider they are agile yeah. across the board. How do we, you know, do we have any stats on, on how projects work there or do we even consider they're not really doing projects, they're doing experiments? Yeah, and that's the key. So they, you look at a company like a, a Spotify of the world um, they're continually experimenting with their product. I think they, I don't want to speak for them, but I believe they've moved beyond the concept of a project per se, and they're more into continual flow of, of experiments and ideas into their products, which is more like the sushi train. This is a continual flow of product into your dinner, right? Yes? The, the whole concept of the no estimates, it seems like we're trying to drive a oil tanker <laughs> so he's saying we're trying to drive an oil tanker through a slalom course. We're trying to, I, I know, I understand the, the concept of the, we have compliance. Right. Those projects are not optional. Right. right. Why estimate them? I wouldn't. So then that's what, and I probably poorly articulated that. So in the, in the event of compliance or government regulation or the event of we will shut your company down if you don't do this. Just go do the work. I mean, you, you don't have a, your risk is too high. Uh, the cost and time are almost irrelevant. I mean, the, and typically you'll have a deadline on a compliance activity. So you have your, your fixed time, you know what the scope is, go do it and, and, and get it done and, and move on to more interesting work. Yeah, it, it's the conundrum of, um, of fixed scope, fixed time. How many work in a fixed scope, fixed time environment right now? There's more than that ish sometimes. At that point, go build it. I, I don't know why you would address the, the overhead of Agile. Yes? I think 
one of the questions is, okay, we have to do this compliance thing. When do I get my developers back? <laughs> yeah. They're doing the things that are going to provide value. So, well, but no, and that's, that's I want to correct that because I feel like I was a little harsh over here. There's value in keeping the company open. They're doing important work, right? Because you don't get a paycheck if they don't get their compliance stuff done because everyone's out of a job. So I want to make that clear. But it, it's not that it's unimportant, it's that it's, it's defined. Yeah you, don't, yeah, you don't have a choice, so you go do it. But I might have an opportunity that'll close in six months, and the question is, I have to do the compliance thing, can I also take advantage of this opportunity that the window will close in six months? Possibly. I, th there's variables there, right? So can you, can you stand up another Scrum or Agile team quickly and go capture that opportunity, and can you do it in a cost-effective way? Sometimes. Or can you, call, can you call a company like Tim's, who you saw this morning, and say, there's this opportunity, go capture it for us, because we think it's worth X and you cost X minus N, right? I think there's ways to do that. Sorry, so there's one over here, then we'll come back over to these two. So I feel infrastructure solved this issue many years ago with doing um, chargeback units based on consumption. Couldn't you do that in Agile? A card that is one, we charge the business 500. If it's a three, we charge them 5,000. If it's uh, a five, we charge them 50,000. And that way, it gets the same with sand. They, 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 they consume sand, they get charged for that sand. Right. Um, in that way, you know, I don't give estimate of infrastructure up front. They know what it is based on their consumption. Right. And that way, you're still getting paid. You still know what's coming in. But the business also knows what they're consuming. They know their story cards are out there. They see the rate. They know what they're going to get charged. I think it helps normalize those internal discussions. I agree with you. It would get it out of this whole you know, fuzzy math. It makes it, it visible. It doesn't work. It's I transparent, mean, yeah. right? You know, we, we know, and, and I think eventually you can get there through consistency. So I think that's an interesting model to look at for the internal chargeback process. Yes? So I just want to kind of go back to the topic that this gentleman was talking about, where it's really about making a decision whether or not you go after a specific opportunity. Sure. I feel like I, I agree with everything you're saying. I'm, well, that's good, right? I'm, I'm all behind the overall concepts. I think that where I'm stuck is a little bit at, at kind of the project approval or project, at least the, the decision to start something. Um, I think y even if you're not estimating, you're sort of estimating anyway by saying, um, should we even start something? Like let's say, well, if, you, if you're going to give me $100,000 to go build an Agile team and experiment for a while, um, it, at least in the back of your mind, you're thinking, is this going to ultimately cost me somewhere in the hundreds of thousands of dollars range, or is this going to cost me in the tens of millions range, <clears throat> before you even say, yeah, let's, let's go experiment on it, right? So I think, I think that's there's kind some of a element strong of man. high level yeah. order I, of magnitude estimation. I think you've set up a straw man though. So it's not an open ended experiment. Right? So when we go to our executives and we say we'd like to have ten thousand dollars, we're trying to capture a value. We have a desired outcome. It's not here's a hundred thousand, go experiment, hopefully something good comes of it. Like if we can't define the outcome we're after and and understand some kind of value to our customer, we're not ready to ask for that funding. Does that make sense? Yeah, sort of. I still think in the back of your mind there's a, there's a number floating around, whether it's in, in coming out of the IT person's mouth or it's in the head of the requester. It's very possible, but then that should get dispelled quickly when we have actual data. Yeah. Right? Yeah. These are all assumptions that just poison our decision-making process. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, I'm in compliance for reason. Yeah. That I, Okay. I think one of the reasons that we estimate is because our, our sponsors, our PMO says, what is it going to take to get this compliance item done? Yeah. Can they then go get more budget from our central order to cover them so that some of the other projects we plan to do won't get cut? Right. right. So I, mean, I think there is an effort there that we have to come through and estimate. We're in the annual budget. Right. And that's fine. I think it's just a, a budgeting game at that point. And and good luck with it. I, even if you get what you asked for, does that guarantee you're going to be able to do the projects you wanted to do? It's, 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 a, it's a guessing game. Until we get into an experimentation mindset, 
where there are things that we want to do to capture a value that we expect to be there, we're still guessing. Like if you say, I'm going to use a million dollars this year, but really you needed three because this project was far bigger than we could have ever expected, you're still sunk, right? I just, I'd rather look at real things and actually make smaller bets. Like I don't like the idea of allocating you $3 million, which could cost me an opportunity over here when you may or may not even get to that project. So I'd rather as a, so when I've had fiduciary responsibility, I've tried to make my bets as small as possible. Like in Vegas, they hate me. I wanna play $2 blackjack. I don't wanna play for 25 a hand. You know, I want small bets. And I wanna be able to prove that that bet was valuable that earns me the right to make the next bet. Yeah, I mean, our, we have large scale, long term projects. I think within every million dollar program, there's a hundred thousand dollar project begging to get out. These are not requirements. We don't have to work that way. And that, it's just a philosophical difference. Yes? So in the cumulative flow diagram, um, it sort of focuses on the average cycle time and then the whip. Can you, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. In the cumulative flow diagram, yes. it focuses on the average cycle time as well as the whip. Yes. Um, so in a regular scrum process, there's no um, limiting whip, like in a Kanban process? There is, it's interesting. That's a, I think that's a mis misnomer. Okay. Um, within Scrum, we time box to a two-week sprint, so inherently we have a whip limit. And the whip limit is what would fit in a two-week sprint. Okay. But I'm sorry, I cut you off. Or was well, that your question? Well, that was sort of my question. So if, if, if you're not uh, expressly limiting whip in, in each of the processes, you know, um, like in a Kanban process, then is, is that going to cause any problems when you're focusing on trying to not estimate? Well, the focus is not on, we're not trying to not estimate, right? Our focus is on doing small pieces of work frequently, which fits right, like this is actually, I think there are some Kanban experts out there who would say that no estimates ripped off their game. You know, I, I think that that's actually a thing. Uh, it's just continual flow of work. And, and where we get in trouble is where we have these, these constructs of projects and programs that may or may not make sense. Right? And then, well, how do we limit whip in that? Well, I don't know. I'm interested in the continual flow of valuable work. And, and I think, but that is a different model. So, but thank you for that question. Yes? Uh, whenever the financial team comes up with the budget for a project, right, they will, they'll definitely ask the project team or the project manager for the estimate. So it could be many projects in the organization, so they're going to ask for the estimates and then come up with a budget or something like that. Like both work interactively. So how do we think about having no estimates at all? So the question is around, if I understood it correctly, we have a bunch of projects, we wanna make a decision, right? So if we think about the first half of the talk, do you wanna use an estimate to make that decision? Do you think that's the way to go now? I'm sorry, I can't. Yes, definitely you need an estimate. I, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. To some extent, we definitely need an estimate. So because if the uh, upper management needs to spend some money on a particular portfolio or something like that, they need to have an idea about how much is being spent. So the project manager usually gives it, this is possibly I'm going to spend $100,000 on yeah. this project, something like that. I, just, I, I disagree with the premise. I don't think it's a need. So I, I think there is a desire to have an illusion of control. There is this desire that I have this estimate, so, I, so when this goes badly, I, we had it under control, it just it was out of our control, something weird happened, but, but we estimated. There's, there's all of these little constructs that we do, I just wanna wipe all that out. You know, let's make small investments, use real data, and make real decisions, instead of all of these other things that just, Everything else that we do is potentially getting the, in the way of shipping to production. If you think through that, the processes, the practices, the phase gates, all of these things that we put in place are obstructing shipping software. All right? And the more of these you can eliminate, the closer you can get to that continuous flow of value. I'm sorry, do I have to wrap? They're making me wrap. I'm sorry.
but I, I'm happy to stick around if anyone still wants to talk to me.